Isn't it amazing when life isn't well, it can be well? It's so good to be with you this morning, One Church. I can't tell you how um, excited I've been uh, about the opportunity to come and share with you. I have to correct Pastor Jonathan, though. He said that we've known each other for 20 years. Come on, it's been 33 years. I knew Jonathan when he had hair. And Jonathan knew me when I had charm. And life has happened to both of us, but um, it's just, we've been such good friends and our families have been so close for over the years. Um, so my name's Aaron Holbrow. I'm a pastor of a church in Peterborough called The Parish. And I also, as Jonathan alluded to, um, work at a trauma and addiction treatment center in Peterborough um, for first responders, uh, military and law enforcement. And my role there is um, to be a spirituality coach for them. And, and what I do is I help people think differently about things. I help people choose to set aside rigid opinions and, and come to discover something that maybe they've forgotten or maybe they didn't know. And I do that both at the treatment center and I do it at the parish as well. And I'm hoping to do that this morning if you're open. But you have to be open. I've come to discover over the years from working with people that sometimes people aren't interested in learning anything new. We come with our rigid opinions and our ideas clenched in our fists, and we wonder why things aren't changing in our lives. But this is a place where you're invited to come like this and say, God, I thought I knew what I knew, but I'm willing to be wrong. I'm willing to learn. I'm willing to grow. And so um, I'm excited to share with you this morning. Can I also say how brave this series is? Like, seriously, this is a brave series, Living Life Backwards, talking about death and dying. I, I, I've been tracking along um, the past couple of weeks. I even joined Pastor Keith's uh, um, Lunch and Learn last Sunday online just to kind of track with you guys. And what a brave subject matter. Seriously, this is such an incredible, um, important topic to talk about. But I, I got to be honest, when I first got the email from Pastor Jonathan, hey, would you speak and here's your topic, I looked at the topic and thought... Okay, clearly they don't want me to ever come back. <laughs> All right, I'm up for the challenge. And so here I am. I'm excited to share with you this morning what Jesus has taught me about life and death and the living that happens in between. I was 22 years old. I was in my placement in my final year of Bible college. And um, I was right in the middle of my internship and I got a phone call one evening and it was my senior pastor who was in, in charge of my, my internship. And he said to me, Aaron, tomorrow when you come to work, when you come to church, dressed for a funeral. Oh, that was, that was heavy, dressed for a funeral. You know, I got to be honest, the idea of formal attire isn't unusual for somebody who's training to be a pastor, right? I did own one suit, double-breasted. It was, you know, the, the 90s. Um, but death was one aspect of ministry that I wasn't comfortable with. I struggled with the idea of funerals and, and helping people in grieving. That's why I went into youth ministry, because I just felt funerals and dying was just so depressing and so sad. I thought, if I go into youth ministry, I can spend my life wearing Converse All-Stars, and I can avoid triangle sandwiches and scotch mints. That was my goal. So when my pastor called me and told me to dress for a funeral, I asked him on the phone, I said, dress for a funeral, who died? And he said to me, we don't know yet. And hung up the phone. Cryptic. For a Tuesday night, that was cryptic. So the next day I got up, I put on the only suit I owned, I walked into my pastor's office and I said, okay, come on, who's the funeral for? Like, I, I, you got my curiosity here. And he hands me a local newspaper, he says, you tell me. I'm like, what is this? He said, look through the obituaries. I want you to find a funeral that we can attend this morning. I'm thinking, okay, I'm confused. I'm disappointed. <laughs> Funerals aren't easy to go to for people you know. And here I am this morning going to a funeral for somebody I don't know. And little did I know that this unusual request would become one of the most moving experiences of my life. Little did I know that this was going to be one of those moments that was going to change everything that came after it. And I don't know if you've experienced those. I'm sure you have. Right? There are times in our lives where we realize, we become so present, so self-aware that we say, this is going to change everything. 
The funeral I chose was for a teenager that had been killed in a tragic uh, DUI the week before. Um, the funeral home just happened to be across the road from the high school where this student had attended. And as I arrived for this funeral, I noticed a crushed car that the local police, in cooperation with the school board, had placed on the lawn of this high school as a deterrent, as a visual deterrent. Uh, it may have been a little too much. They haven't done it since. I had been to a number of funerals at this point in my life, but this was the first time I'd been to one for a teenager. This is the first time I'd been in a room filled with that much cortisol, a room filled with that many high school students wailing, and the collective sound of their grief was just completely overwhelming for me. At an age when they were coming to grips with such a huge spectrum of emotions, I could tell that they were not prepared to deal with this new one. And I sat at the back with my pastor and I wept with this overwhelming sense of loss and grief. See, I don't think we talk enough about grief and loss in our culture. And I think it's killing us. Little did I know that spending time in the presence of people that were grieving would wake me up from a slumber I didn't know I was in. You see, if we don't learn to live with an appreciation, with the respect for this finite life we're living in on this earth, if we don't acknowledge that we are going to die, and if we don't expect a certain amount of struggle on that trajectory of life, then we're not living honestly. We're not living honestly, are we? So instead of living while dying, most of us, I think, in our culture, inevitably live while denying. One of the most important secrets to living well. Because unless we come to grips with our own mortality, we will live in fear of it. Especially those of us with faith. If we don't have a healthy appreciation for how precious, how sacred life before death is, how can we appreciate life after death? The poet Wallace Stevens wrote that the beauty of a flower is that it fades. That death is the mother of beauty and only perishable things can be beautiful, he writes. This is why we're unmoved by artificial flowers. Try it next time, gentlemen. Take a bouquet of artificial flowers home to your partner and see if they get excited. I think Wallace is on to something here. You see, everything that we experience in this life, we experience it by way of contrast, don't we? Discomfort teaches us what comfort is. It makes us remember a time when, you know what, things used to be more comfortable. Grief teaches us about the importance of how precious life is. I did a funeral yesterday for a gentleman that died suddenly, unexpectedly, and I watched a room full of people holding tighter those they loved because that's what grief desires to do Help us appreciate how precious this life is. The cold reminds us what warmth is. Poverty helps us appreciate having enough. Sickness wakes us up to how we've taken our own health for granted. And the only reason we experience any form of satisfaction at all is because at some point in our life, we experience scarcity. Sadness reminds us that at some point we were happy and death desires to teach us to truly live. And not just our death, but any death. Any death desires, I believe, to wake us up. Because contrary to, to, to what I think we, we want to believe, you cannot spiritually bypass death. When I grew up in the 80s at my local church, the only thing it seemed that God could do with suffering, with struggle, with grief, was to get rid of it, it seemed to eliminate it. And we use these cliches to bypass the sadness of it, the gravity of it. Ah, oh, they're in a better place. You know, God needed an angel. You know, it's all part of God's plan. And it's amazing because the way the elders in my church talked about how bad the world was, about how amazing heaven would be, I don't understand why everyone was so afraid about getting sick and dying. 
You have to understand how this sounds to a child, to a teenager, listening to people talk about how heaven's so great and the earth is so terrible. And then when they get sick, it's like, well, you're going to probably get there fairly soon. You should be excited. You think they'd be pining for something terminal, right? So that they could, they could, you know, get to this, this, this heaven they're pining for. Instead, they pray from, for God to deliver them from everything, from sickness and poverty, toothaches and bad grades, and unknowingly, perspective. As a teenager, I grew up thinking that life was about avoiding discomfort as a Christian. It was about avoiding anything that, that was uncomfortable or disruptions at any cost. But in my attempts to live without any discomfort, any disruption, any struggle, I was not prepared for it. I was not prepared for life. I don't know if, if Toronto is the same as Peterborough. I'm going to assume it is, but... You probably get those people who come knocking at your door, um, especially in the fall uh, when it gets darker after four, and they're there to try and sign me up for their version of heaven. They've got their ticket they want me to, you know, to, to buy into, and it's usually someone very frail looking with a small child in the hopes, I think, that I'm going to invite them in. Um, and many people don't answer the door, but I do. I enjoy these conversations. And they'll begin to tell me about how terrible the world is and do I know it's coming to an end and do I know that there are those that are going to be rescued from this terrible place. And, and I stopped them and I said, I got some questions for you. Let me ask you something. Just be on, off the record. No one's going to tell anybody. Does your faith offer you anything for the struggles and difficulties we experience in this life? Because all I hear you talking about is, is, is what, what, what God wants to give me in the next life. Now, I've got to be honest. If your faith doesn't offer me anything to deal with the struggles and difficulties in this life, then I do not trust it for the next one. I'm sorry. Most people need Jesus in the here and now, not just in the hereafter. Life is about disruption. Sickness happens, right? Our bodies get old. People die. We lose our jobs. Our hair falls out, right? Relationships fall apart. Sickness and dying is a part of what it means to be alive. Let's accept that. It's part of the spectrum of what it means to fully be alive. And being fully human doesn't make you less spiritual. Jesus showed us this. Viktor Frankl, one of my a big inspiration in my life, um, is an Austrian psychiatrist. And he writes that the meaning of life isn't about avoiding struggle, but instead choosing meaningful struggle when we can and attaching meaning to the struggles we didn't choose. Just hold this for a minute. Just sit with this for a minute. Because I know at first it's kind of disrupting. It's kind of, you know, What? What, 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 what do you mean? Now, before we, we unpack this a little bit, let me just explain something to Viktor Frankl. He should know. The man who wrote this should know what he's talking about. He struggled through three concentration camps during the Second World War, during which he, he lost his parents, his brother, and his wife, an unborn child. Oh, well, he survived. And he came out of that experience having already, you know, uh, earned uh, his, his degree in psychiatry and, and studied as a neurologist, but this began to shape his experience. Now, for those who would ask, well, why would you choose suffering in struggle? It doesn't make any sense. Why would you choose suffering? How can the meaning of life be about choosing meaningful struggle? I want to suggest you already know the answer to that. If you're in this room and you're married, you're in a relationship, those are hard. Look at the divorce rate. Why would you choose to, you know, get married in a day like this? I'll tell you why, because it's meaningful. You choose that because it's meaningful. If you have kids in this world, if you're choosing to have kids, you haven't had kids yet, but it's the plan, and I'm sure you've had people say to you, don't have kids. Are you kidding? kidding? This world, the way it is, it's irresponsible to have children. You've probably heard this. I want to interrupt that thinking. They're wrong. They're wrong. Having children is about choosing meaningful struggle. In fact, they say it's one of the greatest acts of hope in this world. Many of you chose careers 
knowing they wouldn't be easy. Why would you do that? Why would you choose careers that wouldn't be easy? I stand in front of, like I said, law enforcement and first responders and military, and I, I say to them, you know, you chose these jobs. Why would you go into this? Everybody told you it was going to be hard. I'll tell you why you chose it, because you knew it would be meaningful. You thought there might be a contribution I can make. Maybe the world on my watch could be a more beautiful place, a safer place, a kinder place, a gentler place. That's why you chose these meaningful places. So we already get this, don't we? We already understand that the goal of life is to choose meaningful struggles when we can. But listen to what Victor says here. And the struggles we didn't choose, we need to find a way to attach meaning to those. Because for most of us, many of the things we're experiencing weren't our choice the consequences of someone else's actions or just our, our bodies breaking down. Wrong place, wrong time, who knows? Genetics, it doesn't matter. Victor says that when we find those struggles we didn't choose, we need to attach meaning to them. Otherwise, experiencing a struggle that has no meaning is only pain. No wonder it's unbearable. No wonder so many people have to turn to addiction and find escape because their pain is unbearable because it has no meaning. Some of the things they've experienced are meaningless. And there's no one to justify them. Victor is on to something here. We need to find a way to attach meaning to the struggles we didn't choose. Now, meaning doesn't get rid of the struggle, but it helps diminish the impact of the things we didn't choose. And I think Jesus has something to say here. I think Jesus has something to say to us. There's this important moment in the life of Jesus that we read through the biographies that we read in the New Testament, these gospels. In Mark's biography of Jesus specifically, chapter eight, it says this. It says that Jesus began to teach them that the son of man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed. And after three days, rise again and he said this plainly. And he began, and Peter takes him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and seeing his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, get behind me, Satan, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. And calling the crowd to him with his disciples, he said to all of them, if anybody would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and for the gospel's sake will save it. I'm going to stop right there because there's just so much to unpack. I could have continued this passage, this, this interesting interaction with Jesus. But there's just so much right here for us to unpack. This is the first time in Mark's gospel that Jesus will tell the disciples plainly that he's going to suffer. That he's going to die. That he's going to rise again. He's going to tell them three times. But this news, every time, is so disruptive. It couldn't come at a worse time for the disciples. Just weeks prior to this, this engagement with Jesus, they fed 4,000 people. Several weeks prior to that, they fed 5,000 people. The disciples still have croutons in their pockets from the first time. This first luncheon Jesus did, they still got some dried fish kicking around. Right? These guys have seen some unbelievable things. They've just watched Jesus in the previous verses here. They've watched him heal a, a blind man in Bethsaida. They watched him restore hearing to somebody who was hearing impaired in the Decapolis. They watched him walk on water. They were with him when he spoke to a storm and had it stop. These disciples, they're having the time of their life. Their life is surreal. Imagine this, picked from utter obscurity, fishing with their fathers to experiencing all of this. How do you prepare for that? You can't. They must feel like there's nothing we can't do with this Jesus, man. This is awesome. Think about it. We don't ever have to get hungry, okay? Jesus can just multiply stuff, right? We don't ever have to get stranded and, you know, if our boat gets a flat, Jesus can just fix it, right? This is, what he, this is what they've been experiencing. Jesus is like the best for them. This is fantastic. So when Jesus interrupts the story they're telling themselves, when he tells them that he's going to suffer, when he tells them that he's going to die, and he tells them that he's going to rise again, you don't see it here, but there's a, there's a record scratch in the Greek. When he says, I'm going to suffer, it's like, what? Okay, Jesus, this is, this is news. 
This is news. Of course, they don't hear the words rise again because the words suffering and death are so loud. They still are. They still are. Jesus isn't mincing words here. Mark writes that he tells them plainly. That word literally means without ambiguity. Okay? Couldn't be more simpler. Okay? And Jesus will tell them again two more times. He will tell them again in Mark chapter 9, verse 30, where it says that they still didn't understand and were afraid to ask. Why were they afraid to ask? Because they're in denial. They're in denial. They refuse to accept that suffering can be redemptive. And then again in chapter 10, verse 32, Jesus will tell them one more time that he's going to suffer on his way towards Jerusalem. You see, Jesus is modeling something here I think that would be good for all of us to understand. That we learn to deal with our own struggles and even our own death by talking about it. By considering it. Or by being with others in their struggles, in their dying, and letting them talk of it. We can learn vicariously. We don't just have to touch the stove to know it's hot. You can believe your brother as he's got his fingers bandaged. And if we don't talk about it, and if we don't let others talk about it, we're unprepared for it at all. Jesus could have sprung this on the disciples, couldn't he, at the last minute, right? The last supper, he could have just told them, hey, pass the salt. By the way, tomorrow's not gonna be what you think, right? He could have sprung this on them, but he doesn't spring this on them. Instead, he tries to prepare them as best he can for this. Months in advance, not just once, but several times, he's trying to give them a new way of thinking about what they're going to experience. Because the way of man is to avoid suffering at all cost. But in avoiding suffering, it causes more. A friend of mine who works in animal science has told me that when animals are afraid of dying, they become violent. So do we. So do we. It looks different. But fear will cause us to do terrible things. Terrible things to those we don't know and not just those we do. We violently protect, we violently withhold because we are afraid. And Jesus interrupts that cycle by offering us a new way to hold everything for us. Because if you're not prepared, you're unprepared and most likely in denial which is what we see from the disciples, right? What does Peter do here? He takes Jesus aside and says, nope. No, no. Not gonna happen, Jesus. No way, no. Why do you think he's saying this? You think he's just had this moment where he's just, you know, feeling righteous? You think he's doing this because he's noble? No, he's doing this because he's afraid. He's afraid. Jesus, no, this can't happen like this. So it's not going to happen like this. I'm sorry. It is not going to happen like this. He cannot fathom how this could be a good thing. What universe could this be a good thing, Jesus? I'm looking behind us. It's nothing but helping people, filling bellies and souls. Are you kidding me? In what way is this a good thing? Jesus, this is avoidable. We can avoid this. We can bypass this. Why would you? I'll tell you why. Because the universe that God fashioned, he fashioned from nothing. Ex nihilo, out of nothing. That's what God does best. He takes meaningless things, voids, and he speaks life into them. He creates meaning where there was only meaninglessness. And maybe we should just redefine meaninglessness in our life as the raw state of divine potential the raw state of divine potential and trust that out of nothing God does their best work. Peter isn't just standing in Jesus' way, he's standing in his own way. Often it's not the struggles that sabotage us, right? If we're honest here today. It's not just the struggles that sabotage us, it's the lack of meaning in the struggle. Oftentimes it's, it's success that sabotages us. Meaning is what humbles us, brings us back to earth, centers us. And Jesus responds to Peter's rebuke, right? And look what he does. He calls him the Satan, right? This is a word that literally means one who stands in opposition. He uses this word figuratively. He's saying, don't be this adversary for me. Don't stand in my way. Peter is trying to stop something that he's afraid of. And Jesus tells him to get behind him instead of in front of him. That's literally what this means. And then when Jesus then turns to the crowd, He uses the exact same word. He uses it immediately. He turns to the crowd and he says, if anybody wants to follow me, 
That word could also be translated, if anybody wants to get behind me, then you must deny yourselves. Take up your own cross and follow. He's alluding to the idea of trusting God and being willing to suffer for something beautiful, something meaningful. Jesus is saying, Peter, get behind me. Don't stand in front of me. Don't, don't be in my way. And then to, to the crowd, to us, the invitation is for us to get behind him. Why? So we can follow him. So he can show us how to get to where he's leading. And where is he leading us? To the far side of pain. Through it all. And we don't need to be afraid. And struggle is a part of that journey. Because that's life. Struggles enable change, but often don't demand it. Oh, you can fight it, and many of us do, and that's why so many are stuck. If we can't change our circumstances, we can surely change the way we experience them. That's what faith's all about, well, how we think about them. And by doing so, we can diminish the impact of them, affording a new perspective and a new way to hold them in some margin, in some space. And it's the beautiful gift that Jesus invites us to follow him. Not just to the cross, but through the cross. To the other side. To the meaningful culmination of a beautiful life. To resurrection. You see, Jesus' death mattered because his life mattered. His life mattered because it was meaningful. It was meaningful not because he avoided struggle or suffering, but he chose meaningful struggle. He could have clearly avoided it, yes, but he set aside what could have been good for what was better. And the cross became for him this culmination of everything he taught, everything he lived, embodied in that beautiful moment. I think too many Christians today, they hear Jesus say, hey, come follow me. And we say in return, well, Jesus, you know what? I know where you're headed. Why don't I just meet you there? Why don't I just meet you there? How about I meet you on Easter Sunday? I'll meet you after resurrection. We've missed it. We've missed it. Jesus doesn't say, meet me there. He says, follow me there. We've forgotten that life isn't about getting somewhere. It's about who you become along the way. That's the power of struggle. That's the power of faith. Friends, we need a better relationship with the disruptions of life, don't we? One that believes that all things are redeemable, and I think this is what faith affords us. This is the gift. When I talk to people that don't have faith, but only have pain, only have struggle, I share with them, this is what faith offers. A new lens by which we can understand, a whole new vocabulary by which we can describe the things behind us that are no longer holding us back, but are now offering us a beautiful perspective. Eight years ago, um, my wife and me were at a wedding and, and she was having some pain in her lower back and so I took her home. And the next morning she was uh, struggling and so she asked if I'd take her to the hospital. So I took her into the emergency room and um, after a number of tests, they sent her home with an antibiotic for an infection. Several days later, she was having trouble walking. There was tingles, there was numbness. 14 days later, she'd be paralyzed from the chest down. Eight months of hospitalization three different hospitals here in Toronto, and she'd be discharged as a paraplegic into my care. It was hard because there was no accident to get mad at, no drunk driver to curse, no tumor to be, you know, to, to, to fuel my anger. It was a strange, rare autoimmune disease. Her own body seemed to betray her in this moment. So who do you get mad at? You shake your fist at the heavens and you say, God, this isn't supposed to be like this. And eight months of bad news getting worse and worse and worse. And you're pastoring a people that come to you and say, pray that my troubles go, oh, wait a minute. I don't want you praying for me because your prayers don't seem to be working for your own wife. <laughs> you're darn right. I was completely unprepared. Amy spent the last several months at Lynnhurst, which is a spinal cord uh, rehab center um, just next to Sunnybrook, where she was able to come to grips with her new reality. She went in asking, why me? She left asking, why not me? 
She's with 300 people, various forms of paralysis, quadriplegics, paraplegics. She learned a whole new perspective of life and living. She was able to come to grips with something. She was offered a new perspective. It was a complete disruption, both in our lives and our thinking. And I remember the moment on the 401, coming back from visiting our, her neurologist at Sunnybrook Hospital, months after she'd been discharged, and we'd seen the MRIs of her lower spine. And I stopped fighting. I stopped resisting. My prayers changed that day. My fist was lowered and my hand was opened because I surrendered. I stopped resisting a diagnosis. I stopped resisting a story that wasn't supposed to happen this way. And I just surrendered. I said, God, I won't resist the present moment anymore. Even though I don't want to accept it, resistance is killing me. It's exhausting. Instead, I opened my fists symbolically and I said, God, I surrender. I surrender in this moment. And as I do, I will trust that you're with us. And in that strength you provide, we will rise up and we will respond accordingly to this life we find ourselves in. You see, denial, like I said, is exhausting. It robs you. Faith has taught me to accept the present moment instead of resisting it. And I have learned to rise up, like I said, and respond in a way that is empowered by God's strength. So three years ago when I found out I had stage three cancer, it was like, are you kidding me? I thought my life was a comedy. Turns out it's a tragedy. I'm not prepared for this. I came home to tell my wife she was, I was devastated because I was her caregiver and this was just too much. Six months of chemotherapy. This is un, unsustainable. And I remember telling her between sobs and I looked, she looked at me, took my face in her hands and she said, Aaron, if we haven't learned anything from my suffering over the years, we're doing it wrong. We're doing it wrong. You see, here's what I've discovered. The miracle of faith isn't that it manipulates or changes the prognosis. The miracle of faith is that it desires to empower us for any prognosis. Several years later, me and my wife were being interviewed on a podcast with someone who worked in grief and hospice care. And they were interested in my wife's story and, and, and my story as her caregiver. And so during the interview, he asked this really interesting question. Listen to this. It's a thought experiment for sure. He said, Amy, if I could offer you the promise that when you wake up tomorrow, you'd walk again. In fact, you'd have your entire life back, the one you had eight years ago. If somehow I could miraculously offer you that, you would be the same person you were before all of this suffering, all of this loss, and all you have to do is go to sleep, and you would wake up into that reality. And then he said this. He said, but before you answer, there's one caveat. There's one clause. That when you return to your old life, you can't take with you anything you've learned. Well, that puts a downer on it. <laughs> You'll wake up exactly who you were eight years ago. So Amy thought about it. It was a tough question because she loved her life eight years ago. It was a beautiful life eight years ago. She loved the ability to walk and feel. Who wouldn't want that? But at what expense? Here's what she said. I've learned too much. I've learned too much about myself, about my faith. I've learned too much about God. I'm no longer afraid of death. I don't want suffering, but I'm not afraid of it anymore. Because I've suffered so much, I've learned. I have a deeply meaningful life, she will tell him. It's hard, I wish it was easier at times, but I wouldn't want to lose all that struggle has taught me because I'd have to learn it again and again and again. Here's the thing, isn't it? If we don't learn it the first time, we're, we're doomed to repeat it again and again and again until we can stop and we can learn from it. She says, I've come too far to go back again. 
You see, Amy is learning the difference between happiness and joy. Happiness just requires circumstances to exist. You all experience this. Happiness is a wonderful feeling, but it's based largely on circumstances. That, that approval, that relationship, things. Um, and most of us, our lives are just you know, filled with just wanting to be happy, but that's a house of cards. It's all based on circumstances. If circumstances create it, the same can ruin it. And we become afraid. We just spend our time acquiring, then protecting our happiness. But joy is different. Joy is different. Joy doesn't require circumstances to exist. Joy only requires meaning to exist. Is my wife happy? Most days, no. She's in pain, chronic pain, neurological pain. But does she have joy? Yes, at times, many times. Why? Because her life matters. It's deeply meaningful. Joy only requires meaning. Does this matter? Can this matter? Struggle without meaning is only pain. No wonder we want to avoid it, but faith offers us a beautiful promise of resurrection. I define resurrection this way, life where it shouldn't be. Life where it shouldn't be. Resurrection, uh, and not just at physical death, but on the other side of all the things that die in this life. The death of our dreams, the death of our hopes, of promises, of relationships. Life is filled with loss. And faith says to us, trust and follow the one who can take you to where he's headed. Through what you're experiencing, beyond what you're experiencing. And I believe in resurrection, not just because it happened, but because it happens. We are resurrection people. So may you consider your relationship with the disruptions we experience in this life. May we quit looking for your Jesus outside of your struggles and start seeing him inside with you, saying, follow me. I've been through. And may you sit at the feet of those who you know who've been through struggle, who are in struggle. And may you ask them to teach you everything they've learned. Friends, go to every funeral. Visit the sick. Care for the hurting. Not because it's going to save them, but because it's going to save you from yourself. Let me pray in closing this morning. Loving God, we woke up to this beautiful day that you had begun without our knowing. God, it makes us wonder what other beauty awaits us. How much are we sleeping through? God, would you open our eyes? Would you open our hearts? And may we notice what is already in our life, not just what's missing from our life. And may this time together here this morning Help us set the pace for our time apart. Because if we can find you here this morning, we can trust that you're also where we're headed this afternoon, where we need to go this week. And God, may the world, may Toronto be a kinder, more gentler place because we've chosen to gather here this morning in your name. Amen.